Rain is the beginning of all things in Gippsland. Its lush green beauty, its fertility, its rivers and wetlands, and its floods. People who live here look upon the floods as disasters, unexpected calamities. But floods are a part of the nature of Gippsland. The rivers have overflowed most winters for millions of years, and the local animals and plants are well adapted to changing water levels. Some respond to flood by new growth, some by mating, some go away. An unusual response is to create new temporary living space. These gossamer curtains, which appear during floods, provide a temporary home for millions of wolf spiders. Normally they live on the ground and catch their prey by pouncing on them. When the ground becomes sodden, they spin silken filaments that are carried by the wind and become draped over bushes to provide a high, dry refuge. Insects that get caught up in the silk attract and excite the spiders, but they aren't eaten. They're not appropriate food, and in any case, the spiders are too busy organizing their temporary accommodation. Other spiders also use gossamer threads as parachutes to drift from one place to another, but we seldom notice them. The wolf spiders are noticeable because they're in such vast numbers. It looks like a population explosion, but all that's happened is that they've become visible. Animals have adapted to life in the floodplains, but people are less flexible. They were attracted to Gippsland by the fertile river flats and settled there, just where the floods are most severe. In the year 1870, there was a succession of unparalleled floods throughout the province, doing immense damage to highways and watercourses. The McAllister and Thompson rivers were flooded 17 times, and the adjacent swamp 13 times. The cemetery east of the Mitchell Gardens was flooded, the strong current carrying away bodies from the graves. The same flood uplifted the Puntman's house and floated it downstream, the family fortunately just escaping an involuntary voyage. The more experienced residents had portable boats and temporary houses. Settlers wanted better accommodation. On Christmas Eve, I shall have been two years under tarpaulin. High time I had a roof. Roofs were made with bark or shingles from the local forest and walls from wattle and mud from the swamps. But in the early days, a small house was not necessarily a mark of poverty. A successful settler could afford to rough it while his wealth built up and meanwhile there were other things to spend money on. Horses were grazing on the holding. Their sons and daughters each had their riding hacks and ponies. Their parents had their buggies and a pair. Birds could come and go, but most settlers were tied to their properties. Supplies brought in during the summer months had to last through the isolation of winter. There is no doubt that before the earliest settlers arrived, the greatest concentration of native animals was around the river flats. The flats were not cleared, and there was plenty of shelter for wild animals. Native cats were particularly numerous. Native cats, better called quolls, 
are carnivorous marsupials. They're now very rare, and we don't know why. Certainly, we destroyed much of their habitat. It may be that they couldn't compete with true cats that went wild, and it's possible that they were nearly wiped out by a disease late last century. They liked hen's eggs and young chickens. They regularly raided our kitchen also, getting at the flour bag or any bread or such that they could find. I remember my father taking me duck shooting with him, and we hid in tall reeds bordering a small lagoon. Presently, the whole place seemed to come alive with native cats. At least 20 could be seen at one time in the bright moonlight, scampering and chasing up and down the logs and rustling through the reeds. It's unlikely that we shall see these beautiful marsupials again in Gippsland. Their disappearance was part of the price of progress. The wealth of Gippsland found its expression in houses like this one at Strathfieldsay, built by one of the first settlers. Towns grew up to serve the prosperous farmers as regular trade was established with Melbourne by road, sea and rail. By the 1880s, the main towns were well on the way to becoming provincial cities. Just below the soil of central Gippsland are great seams of brown coal, not seriously exploited until the 1920s. Previously, black coal had been imported from New South Wales, but when strikes interfered with supplies, Victoria embarked on a policy of energy independence. It was a gigantic enterprise. Most of the coal was used to generate electricity for distribution to Melbourne and other large centres. The rest was used as domestic fuel. The enterprise continues to grow. Victoria now obtains most of its electricity from brown coal. The remains of plants accumulated in Gippsland swamps about 50 million years ago. There's been an environmental cost. About 8% of the water flowing down the Latrobe River each year is diverted to power generation, irrigation and urban and industrial use. By the year 2000, this could rise to 30% and the river and the swamps below would then be in real trouble. Increased industry has brought more people to the area. People and industry make wastes. Wastes mean pollution, which brings death to natural systems. The black edges of this swamp are a warning of change, a warning of what may happen. But the river swamps still provide a home for birds, although less than in the early days of settlement. Thousands of black swans and ducks were on the surface and they almost darkened the air as they rose to our approach. Wild fowls swarmed everywhere and for some years could be shot from the doorways of the houses. The number of birds indicates the richness of the food supply. The variety of bird life reflects the variety of their food. Fishes, frogs, crustaceans, worms and mollusks, all dependent in the long run on the plant life of the swamps. Microscopic water plants, known as phytoplankton, are often quite good swimmers. Although invisible to the naked eye, these are true plants which in the same sense as a cabbage or a carrot, use solar energy to make food from carbon dioxide and water.
These tiny animals feeding on phytoplankton are rotifers. They draw in food on rotary currents set up in the water. Some phytoplankton live in groups. This type occurs in bundles and each one can slide against the others. The long filaments are simple plants made up of a chain of similar cells. Where there's life, there's death and decay and an opportunity for scavengers, such as these minute crustaceans. Stentor is about the size of a needle's eye and feeds, like a rotifer, by creating a tiny whirlpool around its mouth. Many other microscopic animals also use tiny hair-like structures to create currents of water for feeding and swimming. Most of them can reproduce by simply splitting in two. Simple planktonic plants do the same, but more complex ones have to go about it more elaborately. These rolling spheres are plants made up of thousands of similar cells. Daughter plants develop into smaller spheres inside the parent. They're released through a break in the parent body, a sort of voluntary caesarean section. This rotifer is so stuffed with phytoplankton that it's green inside. Here's a pregnant one with several embryos. We are watching a virgin birth. Males simply don't exist in most species of rotifers. Rotifers normally live as separate individuals, but these are fused into a common body. What could be called a rotary club if they weren't all females. Among the most beautiful single-celled animals are the heliozoans, or sun animals. Beautiful and deadly, as this rotifer discovered. Any small animal that blunders into a heliozoan is pulled down into its body, not through a permanent mouth, but anywhere through the surface. Our plants may suffer the same fate. This heliozoan has been eating phytoplankton. Since phytoplankton is the basic food of most aquatic life, 
environmental scientists keep a close watch on it as an indicator of the condition of these waters and their probable future. Larger, more familiar plants are food for larger, more familiar animals. Swans feed on ribbonweed. There's plenty to go around, partly because few other birds can eat it. It's curious that a swan is a symbol of aristocratic grace. In fact, its life is more like that of the humble cow. Its pasture is a swamp. Like the river flats that attracted the early graziers, the swamps around the lower reaches of the Gippsland rivers are rich in nutrients and their influence extends into the surrounding area where there are plants that thrive in soggy soil and insects associated with water. The damselfly is a cousin of the dragonfly. We see it in its brief moment of adult glory for it spends most of its life as a larva on the muddy bottom of the swamp. The swamp bottom is a nursery for many species of insects. These are midge eggs embedded in a protective mass of jelly. At the end of its development in the egg, a midge hatches as a swimming larva, rather like a mosquito wriggler. It swims around, scooping up phytoplankton. Like many insects which begin their lives in water, midges have a very brief life as flying adults, just long enough to find a mate and reproduce. Swampy areas form a backdrop for many amazing relationships between animals and plants. This orchid, for example, seduces a male wasp. The orchid produces a scent which so closely mimics the odour of a female wasp that the male makes love to the flower, which leaves him carrying two packets of pollen. On his next visit to a flower, the pollen is transferred. It's fine for the orchid, but the wasp doesn't even get a sip of nectar. These are sundews, beautiful plants that eat animals. If a fly touches the sticky drop of dew at the end of a tentacle, it's trapped. The other tentacles close in around the insect and each drop begins to digest and dissolve its body. The insect soup 
is absorbed into the plant through the tentacles. And the whole of this complex process is coordinated without muscles or a nervous system. But there's no invincible weapon in nature. This bug thrives amongst the tentacles and feeds by sucking up the juices of the trapped insects. It seems that the dew doesn't stick to its body. The bug has made the sundew its home. It's a species which has evolved in association with the plant and its only food is what it can steal from its host. So the sundew and insects interact in contrasting ways. It feeds on some and provides food and shelter for another. But there's a third relationship where the plant itself gets eaten. Here's a caterpillar which moves amongst the tentacles with impunity and actually feeds on them. The sundew coexists with the caterpillar that eats it with the bug that steals its food, and with the insects that it catches. Multiply this simple pattern many thousandfold, and we have a natural ecosystem, a community of interdependent plants and animals. Elsewhere around the swamps, insects play their more usual role, using the plants. This one uses a plant to build a miniature portable log cabin, a silk tube reinforced and camouflaged with sticks. It's a case moth caterpillar. Each stick is chewed off at a length measured by the caterpillar. No axeman could make a neater cut. But here's where the caterpillar beats the axeman. The stick doesn't fall. This is only a preliminary fitting a rough check that there's a place for a stick of this length. The stick is cleaned from end to end and covered all over with a thin layer of sticky silk. Now it can be made part of a master-built residence constructed from plant material. Most caterpillars, on the other hand, use plants only as building sites. Like this cup moth caterpillar, they provide the construction material from within their own bodies. Silk, which is spun into a cocoon, Inside its cocoon, the caterpillar gradually ceases to exist. Life doesn't stop, but most of the caterpillar's body is broken down. All of its instincts and whatever simple things it may have learnt are wiped from the slate as the tissues of its body are reorganised into a moth. The cup moth and the case moth, in their construction and breakdown, reflect the balancing forces at work in all of nature growth and decay, using and being used, eating and being eaten. So it is with floods. They may be destructive, but they enrich the soil and bring nutrients to the swamp. Thanks to the nutrients, the swamps are rich in fish and bird life. Thanks to the rain, the floods and the fertile soil, Gippsland is rich in natural resources. But as dams are built to control floods, and water is diverted for human use, complex natural relationships will change in the direction of man-made systems. It's up to us how far we allow the change to go.